Thank you, uh, Justo, for this uh, nice introduction. And uh, thank you, Philip. And well, obviously, I have to thank you, all of you. It's, uh, it's Sunday, very early on Sunday, and here you are. So hopefully, for the next 45 minutes or so, I will be able to uh, wake you up with uh, just some kind of uh, overview of what is happening in this uh, complex uh, field of uh, putting together something as classical as uh, nutrition and something as relatively novel as genetics. The question is how uh, we can use uh, the combination of both, the interaction of these two fields in order to achieve a better prevention of these metabolic diseases, endocrine diseases that we are uh, experiencing and the problem that we have nowadays. And uh, I will focus on what I know a little bit, which is lipoprotein metabolism, as Justo was saying, and also obesity. Uh, well, I don't have any conflict of interest to declare about everything that I'm going to say. And uh, in terms of uh, what we are, we can compare ourselves to this kind of uh, motherboard that we can find in our computers and our uh, telephones, intelligent telephones. And uh, obviously all these uh, circuits uh, underneath all these are these genes that we have been able to study in the last uh, few years. Uh, so, the connections between the different points in these uh, metabolic pathways that uh, are represent our uh, physiology, biology, or whatever we want to call it, uh, as you know, each one of us is different, that's obvious. A lot of that, dif oh, yeah, considerable amount of that difference comes from precisely the genetic variants that we have. Uh, we have millions of them. And this is why, uh, yeah, I mean, each, each one of us is different. Uh, the way that everything in our bodies work, uh, the wheels that turn are different. But also, we should not forget uh, that we are immersed in this cloud that, we, that is uh, our environment. And that also is different for each one of us. So it's the interaction between uh, our inner part, which is uh, the genomic part. And this environment is what is going to, uh, at the end of the day, is going to define our uh, health or disease status. Well, all this, obviously, the fact that we have different connections, if one, each one of us, uh, derived prim uh, primarily from our genetic variation. Uh, another thing that uh, brings up is the fact that to Whatever intervention we use, whether it's the nutritional intervention that we, uh, we do uh, in our research center and so many hundreds of other research centers, or more the pharmacological part or the physical activity, uh, each one of us is going to have different uh, responses. Uh, this is uh, from one of our studies in which people were treated with the same drug, and as you see, in some people, it works very well in terms of changing the cholesterol levels. But in some people, you have even paradoxical responses. And uh, this is something that is ingrained in that motherboard that I was uh, describing to you before. And uh, is defined in part, or in great part, by our genetic variation. Uh, in terms of, we are going to focus uh, the talk in terms of uh, nutrition. And in uh, when we talk about nutrition, uh, as you know, for uh, most of the history of uh, humankind, we have been able to handle uh, nutrition pretty well. But it was about 100 years ago when uh, governments and all that decided that uh, people need help. And then you have here a series of uh, guidelines that have been published in the US through the last 100 years about uh, what people should be eating in order to be healthy. That seems to be rather simple. But when we look at the reality of uh, every day, we all know uh, how confusing or how complex uh, nutrition research uh, has become. Why? Because you see here a series of uh, foods that we use, uh, 
almost every day. And then, uh, well, milk, eggs, butter, meat, fish. And at one point or another uh, in our recent history, these uh, uh, foods, they have been either on one side of the balance or another side of the balance, indicating that at some point they were good and at some point they were bad. Remember, for example, that olive oil that we are now preaching as part of the Mediterranean diet? Well, there was a time, and many of you remember, in which uh, the olive oil was bad. Why? Because obviously it was fat, and all fats are bad. And the same is true for omega-3s and what? Practically everything that we have here. So, uh, in terms of recommendations, they change, and they, they have been changing with time because uh, we have in nutrition most of these guidelines and a lot of the research comes from the epidemiological field. And uh, in that area, we have an Achilles tendon that it has been uh, hunting us for a lot of time. And so far, we don't have a, a solution yet. As you know, uh, when it comes to learning about what people are eating, we have to use dietary instruments, whether is a food frequency questionnaire in which uh, people ask you, or a nutritionist or a researcher ask you, what did you eat during the last year? Ask that to yourself, and you will, I mean, and we are all uh, very intelligent people, and uh, we are uh, professionals, and think about the answers that you could give to a questionnaire that asks you about how many times did you eat potatoes, or carrots, or eggs, during the last year? Well, it will be difficult to, to give a precise answer. Well, that's what we are using. Uh, there are alternatives, like the recalls, 24-hour recalls, but that depends on what you ate that specific day or three days that you are using. So we have a very subjective and partial view of what we are eating, but we are using that in order to come out with these either recommendations or publications in which one day uh, milk or daily products are good for you and the following week daily products are bad for you. Uh, so you have this kind of, uh, when it comes to uh, giving dietary advice, what you have uh, after so many uh, kind of pendular movements, what you have among the public is this confusion. And uh, more recently, I mean, if you go to the, to the headlines of the popular press, and this is what people don't read the Lancet or the New England Journal of Medicine, people read whatever newspapers they have around, and uh, journalists are good about uh, contributing to this confusion, but we cannot blame the journalists. We should blame it to ourselves uh, as professionals. And then uh, one week vitamin D is uh, insufficiency, is linked to pregnancy uh, problems, and another week vitamin D in excess causes problems uh, in the newborns, and the same for practically everything that you see. Uh, eggs have been in the, in, uh, on the spot for many years uh, in terms of the relation with cholesterol levels. Well, we know that the relation with cholesterol levels is not that uh, uh, dramatic. But also, more recently, well, you can see that some certain components of eggs are even good for high blood pressure. Uh, so this is the kind of things. And uh, for example, two weeks ago, there was a meta-analysis in which uh, the conclusions were that, well, after uh, blaming saturated fat uh, for cardiovascular disease, cancer, and so on, uh, many other things, well, the meta-analysis says that saturated fat, is not, uh, saturated fat is not bad for you. So this is what we have. And we have many different myths about nutrition, uh, uh, as we have many different myths about uh, other things, like if the earth was uh, flat or it was round, and so on and so forth. So going back to the public, to the people that need that nutritional recommendation, what we have is, again, that confusion. So all the guidelines that we had and all the recommendations and the practice that have been uh, done for the last uh, 100 years is based on uh, this, one size fits all, and uh, at some point we have this USDA pyramid, uh, now we have a plate, and so on. And 
this uh, translated to the reality is like going to uh, the store and having only one size uh, to, to dress. And for some people it would be great, but for some people it doesn't look uh, very good. So the proposal that we have is going from one size fits all to personalized. And for that, which is like going to the tailor in order to build you uh, or to make you the proper uh, custom. And uh, how we can achieve that? Well, it's as we, may, we were indicating before, by taking advantage of all the knowledge that we are accumulating with, uh, within the genetic field. Uh, now, it's important that when we talk about personalization, we are not talking about, yes, building a specific diet for uh, each individual. Uh, that will, be in, it will not be possible. Uh, and uh, it will not be necessary in the same way that when we go and buy shoes, there are different, we know that we are uh, 40 or 41 or 42 or whatever, and that fits as well. So what we are trying to do with this uh, personalized nutrition or nutrigenomics or nutrigenetics or whatever you want to call it, is just to be able to put each one of us uh, in a specific group that, uh, and that's enough, that's enough to keep us uh, healthy, to prevent disease, and in some cases even to revert the disease. And uh, the way that we are achieving that, uh, we have gone through different, obviously, uh, ways to do it in the last two or three decades that we have been working on that. Uh, but uh, what we are looking is, uh, when we compare the sequences of different individuals, we are looking for these small differences that, as you know, we call it single nucleotide polymorphisms, but there are many other uh, types of variations that are going to, that makes us different. Uh, not only different in terms of uh, how we look outside, but also uh, how we handle our metabolism, meaning that uh, motherboard that I was describing to you before. Uh, we have gone a long way in the last uh, three decades in terms of how we can look at our genome uh, and obviously, the progress was uh, pushed by the fact that we were able to uh, sequence the human genome. Uh, in the last few years, what we have been doing is using these microarrays, these gene chips, that in one single uh, shot, in one single analysis, we are able to get information about one, two million of these polymorphisms in each, one, in each individual. So, how we do these studies. There are many ways to do it. This is one example in which we take patients, we take uh, controls, and we do these uh, microarrays, and then we look for differences between uh, patients and non-patients. Uh, patients may be diabetic people, or obese people, or any other uh, phenotype or trait that you can imagine. Anything that can be measured can be subjected to this type of analysis. The outcome is what you see here, are these Manhattan plots, in which what we are looking is precisely for these uh, skyscrapers that uh, indicate that somewhere in this region of, these are the different chromosomes, uh, these are the, these one million SNPs that we are examining. So what we are looking is precisely for these highly significant or statistically significant signals that is telling us that there is there, there is a gene uh, that participates, for example, in diabetes, obesity, or whatever. Now, through the last uh, few years, we have been able to, uh, to have dots uh, practically in any place of our chromosomes associated with, uh, as I was indicating before, practically anything that you can measure, whether it's cardiovascular disease, this epidemia, diabetes, uh, anything. Uh, now we have mapped those diseases to a specific or traits to specific uh, places in the, in the chromosomes. And that's what we are going to use in order to uh, uh, carry out a more preventive uh, medicine than what we are doing nowadays. If we focus on obesity, uh, when it comes to this Manhattan plus that I was telling you about, uh, you have an illustration here of the number of uh, loci or the number of genes that have been identified in the human genome associated with risk of obesity. This is a relatively old slide, but it's the largest study that has been done related to obesity, about 250,000 people, and imagine, 
in this quarter million people, we were able to look at, uh, at about two million SNPs, so polymorphism in each one of them. And the result of that is a number of uh, different genes that were associated with obesity. And the most relevant in terms of the population is this one FTO. Um, but that, that gives you an idea. Uh, now, obviously, this is uh, four years old. Now we have up to about 60 uh, genes identified related with common obesity. So how can we use that? Uh, well, we have this kind of crystal ball that if we carried out this genetic analysis in newborn babies, uh, we could predict with certain level of confidence what is going to be uh, the path that they are going to follow through their lives. So even though may, they may look, uh, I mean, at least from the point of view of BMI or weight or whatever, uh, very similar when they are born, uh, if we were able to carry uh, this uh, genetic analysis uh, at that point, we could say, well, this baby is going to evolve into a lean person, like we have here, or is going to become sooner or later an uh, overweight or obese uh, individual. So, but this is, this is something that is going to happen no matter what, or it's just, as is represented here, a Damocles sword that is hanging over your head. And depending on that cloud that I was describing to you in the second slide, that environment in which we are, then the sword may fall on you, or it may stay like that, and you may not be experience obesity, despite the fact that you are genetically predisposed to, to be. And this is the kind of gene-environment interaction that we are studying. So the hypothesis is that these old genes that we have, that there are tens of thousands of years old, in this new environment that we call it obesogenic environment, is the one that is going to produce that uh, obesity that we have uh, nowadays in our streets. Uh, obesity, I don't have to tell you that, it's complex. It's not just as simple as uh, the energy that uh, we don't use because we are inactive, or all this energy that uh, we consume, but there are many other factors like the type, how you consume that energy, the type of food, uh, whether it's in empty calories. Another aspect <coughs> that I hopefully I will have time to uh, go over uh, with you is the uh, chronobiological aspects, meaning circadian rhythm, uh, sleeping patterns, and so on, that uh, uh, we are finding also that is relevant for the expression of the phenotype. Uh, more and more, we know that uh, obesity, like uh, so many other metabolic diseases, they start here, they start uh, during pregnancy, and even more, we are learning that it's starting even before conception, uh, based on what the parents are doing. And I don't have to tell you either about the, those endocrine disruptors that are part of the, this other environment, the atmospheric environment, that are also related to obesity. So this is the complexity that we have. Uh, obviously, the grad, the, when it comes to nutrition, the gut-brain axis is very important. Now we are able to learn much more about our brain because of the technology, imaging technology that we use. But we are going to touch very briefly certain aspects like the genetic aspect, the chronobiology that I was mentioning, the epigenetics, and how all this interacts with the, uh, our environment. As uh, Justo was saying, I just started my life, my scientific life, uh, with lipoprotein metabolism, and more or less I have continued doing so uh, for several decades. Here we have uh, simplification and oversimplification of what we have. And one of my areas of interest was reverse cholesterol transport, meaning uh, what is HDL doing? And here is what you have HDL, and you have as a, the major player, we can say, at least from the point of view of the protein, uh, APOE1. But we know that now that we are able to do proteomics, the same way that we are doing metabolomics or genomics and so on, we know that HDL has many, many different uh, proteins. Uh, some of them we know what they are doing, and some of them we don't know what they are doing. Um, but here, obviously, just to say HD and APOE1 is, as I was mentioning before, an oversimplification. For example, we have APOE2. APOE2 is an abundant protein. We know APOE2 for the last 40 years. 
And if you ask uh, many of us what Apo A2 is doing, I, I, say, I don't know. I don't, despite the fact, as I say, that he's an, an, an old friend. And it's not even put here because we don't know what he's doing. Well, thanks to the genetics, the ability to do genetics, well, uh, if we have a mutation, a polymorphism in Apo A2, let's see what phenotype results. And this is what we did in several studies. So what I'm going to tell you is about the relation between ApoE2 and obesity, something that yeah, it, was, it was pointed out, in fact, quite a few years ago by somebody known Bouchard, and I don't know if he's related to you, Ian Bouchard, uh, Bouchard in, in, uh, from Canada, uh, that uh, found a relation uh, between ApoE2 and obesity. And much, uh, many years later, we revisited that with the technology that we have nowadays, and this is what we found. What we found is that there is a common polymorphism in the ApoE2 gene that appears to be related to a body mass index. And this variation is in the five prime region of the gene, meaning that it's involved in the regulation of the, of the gene. So in this case, the, this is the polymorphism, minus 265TC, meaning that T is the a normal C is the mutated uh, allele. And what happens here is that if you don't have the polymorphism, or you are heterozygous for the polymorphism, meaning that you got it from your mother or your father, uh, well, this is the amount of calories that you eat every day, about 2,000 calories. And at least in the US, that translates in the population that you were, we were looking uh, in this weight, 88 kilograms. But if you are homozygous for the mutation, this is what happens. You eat more. Yeah, I mean, 2,000, 2,200, that's, uh, that's not too much in terms of a difference. But, I mean, it's 10% every day. And at the end of uh, a year, that means a lot of calories. And obviously, if you don't increase your physical activity and so on, that is going to accumulate. And that is the slowly but surely way for the uh, obesity to... Uh, to be in, uh, within each one of us. So they eat more, they eat more. Uh, and those were studies that we were carrying out in uh, Minnesota and also in Utah. Um, and then what we did is to do the same thing, for example, in the Framingham study, in which uh, I have been uh, working for the last 30 years, and in another population in Boston that were Hispanics, because this population it was entirely white, Framingham is also white, and we wanted to expand beyond being Caucasian to see if what we were seeing here, it was across the board. And in, in the, indeed it was. But again, is this something that, well, if you are born CC, sorry, you are going to eat more and you are going to be obese. Or is like that sword that I was uh, describing to you before, it's just that predisposition is hanging there and depending on what we do, is going to express or not. And this is what we did on, on the different studies. And here what we have is here BMI. And what uh, in this, uh, this group here, we have people that are, at, at least from the point of view of this gene, they are not predisposed to obesity. Whereas these are people that are predisposed to obesity because they are CC. Now, what we have in the bars, uh, light or dark, is whether they are consuming a low saturated fat diet or a high saturated fat diet. If people are not predisposed to being obese, what we have is this situation. It doesn't matter. They are able, their uh, homeostasis is robust and uh, the obesity is not expressed. But if you go to this situation in which you stress your metabolism with saturated fat, then is when you express also that predisposition to being more obese. So it doesn't matter if you are talking about Minnesota or uh, Utah, or uh, the Framingham study, or the Hispanics that live in Boston, you see exactly the same effect. You may be predisposed to being obese because of this polymorphism, but if you are consuming a prudent diet, meaning in this case a low saturated fat diet, then you are okay. It doesn't matter. You are not obese. But 
you trigger obesity when you have this uh, high saturated fat diet. So this is an example of gene diet interaction by which the outcome, uh, the trait is expressed or is not expressed depending on the environment. In this case, the type of, sat of, of fat, the saturated fat. And also when you see, when you take this meta-analysis that people do everywhere, but in this case, the saturated fat, uh, I don't remember, I think it was in the UK. Uh, then uh, what you have is, yeah, saturated fat is not bad for you. Well, it depends. It depends on who you are. If you are in this group, obviously, at least from the point of view of obesity, saturated fat is not bad for you. But if you move out of that uh, group and you are in another group that is predisposed to obesity, you cannot say anymore that saturated fat is not bad for you. It's bad for you because it drives you to obesity and it drives you to all the different consequences of obesity. So this is the, this is the benefit that we have in the future of being able to personalize uh, the dietary recommendations. And this is an example. Uh, all of you are familiar with the Framingham study. This study began in 1948 and now we are in the third generation and we have been following these individuals every two or three years. And this is a snapshot of what happened during the 20 years of the life of uh, these individuals. Uh, just to simplify the, the figure, what we have here are people that have this predisposition to obesity. These two lines represent groups that are uh, individuals that are CC, and these are 20 years of their lives. So you can see that these individuals are predisposed to be obese, but in fact, through their lives, they don't seem to, I mean, everybody with, I mean, as we get older and so on, yeah, we increase our BMI, but nothing dangerous. Whereas these people, you can see how they end up in overweight and they will end up in uh, being obese with all these consequences that we know. What is the difference between these two groups, the ones that we anticipated? These people, they have a, a usual diet that consists on typical American diet, a, a high in a saturated fat and so on, and these people are more a, inclined to consume the Mediterranean diet, which is lower in saturated fat, lower in fat and so on. So this is an example of, a, I will not say, in fact, in real life, of what may ha be happening if a, we use this, because if we know that somebody has this predisposition to obesity early in life, we can convince this person uh, to change path and then it will prevent all this uh, uh, path uh, or this path that is uh, uh, in the future for him or for her. But unfortunately, in many countries, what we are doing is the opposite. And this is the case of Spain, in which uh, we are moving from this type of diet to this type of diet. Okay, so uh, the conclusion of this is that what we were seeing before is a straight line through life. If we are using properly uh, nutrigenomics or nutrigenetics, we can really shift individuals and being able to uh, end up uh, with, at least from the point of view of uh, weight, body weight, with relatively healthy individuals, despite what happens uh, at the moment of birth in terms of uh, our uh, uh, inheritance. We continue, and uh, yeah, I mean, we have, there are things in our, in our lives that change, but something that has not changed in the last few thousands of millions of years is this, is that the Earth revolves uh, around the axis every 24 hours. And see how can we can use that information uh, or that property that every single living thing has, this circadian rhythm, uh, in order to also gain some knowledge about this, uh, the fact that metabolically speaking, we are different every hour of the day. And this is uh, what defines uh, the fact that uh, these, these variations uh, in terms of individuals, whether we are owls or we are larks, uh, it depends uh, in, uh, of our genes and not only on our culture or on our habits. So how can we can use this information uh, in order to 
let's say, applies, if we can say, chronotherapy in order to put people in the, in the right uh, metabolic path. And this is not new because uh, this book was published back in uh, 1797, Jena, and uh, I don't understand German, or I don't read German, but the translation that was done in Boston a few years later, The Art of Prolonging Life. And back then, the author already indicated the importance of following properly the circadian rhythms in order precisely to have a healthy aging. And that's something that somehow we have uh, ignored for many years, at least in many fields. Uh, the, the circadian rhythm, the uh, chronobiology has been ignored. So we have taken that also from the point of view of, uh, of uh, these metabolic disorders uh, that we are interested in and from the point of view of genetics. So this is obviously, we have to synchronize uh, our different clocks. We have a, a central clock, which is in the suprachiasmatic nucleus, and this orchestrates all the different clocks that we have in the adipose tissue, in the heart, in the brain, I, oh no, in the brain I already mentioned, uh, in liver and so on. And if we end up with this situation, this is what uh, will happen. We have the obesity, the metabolic syndrome, cancer, cardiovascular disease, mood swings, cognitive problems, and so on. Why is this? Well, there are some uh, endogenous reasons, like for example, the variations in the genes that are part of the clock machinery, but also the modern life is able to desynchronize or contribute to that uh, disruption of the, of the clock. Because, well, many of you know what is to work during the nights. Uh, there are also factory workers that have to work during the nights. And moreover, uh, we, can, we have the light uh, with us uh, day and night, something that our ancestors uh, thousands of years ago didn't have. So that's uh, the situation in which we have. We have endogenous uh, reasons, which are the genetics, and also exogenous reasons uh, to have this disruption. And these are the outcomes. And this is how the clock works. Uh, th this is the clock machinery. We don't have time to go into the detail, but as you see, it's rather complex. And the first gene that was uh, investigated from the point of view of uh, clock is precise, was uh, named precisely clock. And we have this polymorphism that it reminds us a little bit uh, to what we were seeing before with ApoE2 and obesity. Uh, in this case, it was from the point of view of lipid metabolism, but in this case, it's from the point of view of chronobiology. It depends on uh, your genotype. In this specific polymorphism of the clock gene, that you consume uh, less or more calories. And that translates into what you see here, is that the people that are not, uh, don't, don't have this polymorphism, they are not predisposed to obesity, well, they have this uh, Waist circumference in this case, whereas the people that are predisposed to obesity because of this polymorphism in the clock gene, they eat more and they uh, manifest that uh, overweight or obesity. So you can see uh, the, the complexity of what we have in our hands. But if we tackle the problem, uh, we can again uh, give specific recommendations to, to individuals. Going back to lipoprotein metabolism, this is uh, an area uh, that also talking about clock uh, and circadian rhythm. Uh, we know that one of the drivers of the fact that we are different at different times of the day is precisely this, is that we eat and that puts us into the postprandial state. Uh, and this is a research that uh, I have been collaborating with uh, colleagues uh, Justo, of Justo in, in Cordoba for many years, which is the postprandial metabolism and the relation with genetics. Uh, why is this important? Is because uh, although most of the population studies or even the clinical uh, investigation is done in the fasting state, just to standardize everybody, when you break the, the fasting, people are going to respond in very different ways in terms of how they handle the dietary fat or uh, the food in general. And uh, you have people that are able to uh, use the fat 
the exogenous fat very efficiently, and you don't have a peak in triglycerides, or this is small, and some people that they have an excursion of these triglycerides that is very high. This, is, this part here is not very important. The problem is here, when in the catabolism of these triglyceride-rich lipoproteins, because these particles are uh, highly atherogenic, even uh, at least at the same level that the LDL cholesterol, which is the, 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 what we are measuring nowadays. So it depends on where you are here. You have a higher or lower risk of uh, cardiovascular disease, and you are not able to detect this based on the fasting uh, measures. So it's the, to know this is very important, but obviously to do this in every individual is costly and uh, because you have to keep people for many hours and taking blood samples and so on. So it's not something practical. So something that we have done also from the point of view of genetics is to identify markers uh, that tell us which people are going to be on the upper part of the curve or what people are going to be on the lower part of the curve. Obviously, genetics is not everything. As you have seen, well, in fact, we can go back. If you are a, a woman, you have very good handling, at least until menopause, of this dietary fact, so you will be here. And if you are male and you are old, it's quite probably that you are here. So this is what uh, we have. But in addition to that, we have the genetic component. And we have studied many genes related to this uh, variability. But also we have studied the interaction of these genes with the environment. Here we have another component of the lipoprotein system, which is uh, lipoprotein metabolism, which is APOE5. And this is in the Framingham study again. And what we see is, in this case, for example, polyunsaturated fat intake. And as you know, before we were thinking that all polyunsaturated fat is good, but now we have to make a difference between N6 and N3, because N6 seems to be somehow related to also to increase risk for some uh, traits. But genetics also have something to say. Here we have people that don't have a, a specific polymorphism in the ApoA5 gene, and well, if they consume less or more polyunsaturated fatty acids, omega-6, it doesn't matter. But if you are a carrier of this uh, polymorphism, you see that polyunsaturated fatty acids, omega-6 or N6, are not good for you because they are associated with increased levels of these lipoprotein remnants that are atherogenic. So again, we can, when it comes to personalized recommendations, if you are here, we cannot really give you any specific guidelines or guidance about the amount of omega-6 that you can eat. But if you are here, the recommendation will be to decrease the intake of omega-6 or N6. Now, when it comes to N3s, you can see that there is a different picture because it seems to be beneficial for both uh, uh, groups of uh, um, genotypes. Let's keep going. And now let's uh, just uh, go to the epigenetic component. And as you know, there is a good relation between food and methylation, and this is the most studied aspect of epigenomics, but I am not going to stop on that, because I am going to focus to another more novel aspect of epigenetics. In fact, some people does not classify this as classical epigenetics, which is the microRNAs. The microRNAs is something that, uh, well, we don't know anything about them, at least in humans, uh, until the beginning of this century. Uh, we thought that it was an oddity of uh, C. elegans and uh, other uh, inferior species, but uh, slowly we are starting to find out that these microRNAs are all over the place. Uh, why they are called microRNAs? because of their size. And you know this uh, a gene, an uh, mRNA, a protein. Well, when it comes to microRNAs, that uh, dogma breaks. Because these microRNAs are small enough that they cannot be translated into, into a protein. What are they doing then? What they are doing is uh, binding to the three prime region of messenger RNA. And what they do is they stop or they slow down uh, the translation of these, uh, of these mRNAs. So in practical terms, we have, uh, this is a 
way of fine tuning uh, the genetic regulation. We know the what we knew before is like thinking about a car. Uh, we have two pedals, at least if it's automatic, uh, the brake and the accelerator. And this is what we have in the five prime region of the genes. And this is the example that we put before for APOE2, a mutation in that region or regulatory region of the genes, the classical one, the brake and the accelerator. And depending on the environmental conditions, you push the brake or you push the accelerator and the gene is expressed or it doesn't, uh, it's not expressed. But apparently that's not enough. And we have this additional mechanism of regulation that will be the equivalent to the, the handbrake that you have in order to stop the car. Uh, so these uh, microRNAs, they bind to the mRNAs and they produce their degradation and so on and so forth. So, but what is interesting about these microRNAs is not the fact that they are, uh, they are producing a specific cell and they act on this cell, is that they are uh, packed into uh, vesicular bodies or even into lipoproteins and they can act as hormones and they, uh, they can be used or they can, yeah, they can be used in different cells, in different organs and so on. And this is very important because that has been contributed to a new field, which is to see whether these microRNAs that are circulating in blood can be used as predictors of disease, or how the disease is evolving or not evolving, and the area in which is uh, more, uh, the area that is more advanced is in cancer. Because now people are measuring the levels and the type of microRNAs that are circulating in blood, certain microRNAs, and that can be used for cancer diagnosis, but also, for example, how chemotherapy is working and so on. So this is a very promising field, but again, we have to be careful because it is very new, and as you know, every time that something new comes uh, to the market, it does everything, and we should put it uh, in the context that this is a, it contributes to the problem, it's not just uh, the problem or the solution. So we'll see in a few years how much of uh, all these fireworks that we have about microRNAs uh, remain. In the case of obesity also, depending on, you can measure different microRNAs and people say or people publish that they can even distinguish between these uh, situations that we have now in which you have people that are uh, obese, metabolically healthy, obese, obese, or people that are lean but metabolically obese. So again, there are publications that suggest that by measuring the microRNAs that are circulating in blood, we can get to that level of, uh, of uh, discrimination among the different types of obesity or non-obesity and the relation with metabolic diseases. In our case, in this gene-diet interaction, we have been studying a gene that is relevant a family of genes that is relevant for obesity, perilipins, and that comes from Greek, peri, around, and lipin, lipid, and perilipins are the proteins that are around the fat droplets and protect that fat from the lipolytic enzymes. So, uh, connecting that with these microRNAs, what we have uh, in the perilipin 4 uh, is that this is the three prime UTR of the mRNA, and this is the sequence. What happened is that you have circulating also, well, circulating, or at least in the cell, you have a bunch of microRNAs, like this one, microRNA 5 to 2. Well, they don't seem to have any attraction between this mRNA and these microRNAs. Why? Because they don't uh, have complementation. So the perilipin 3 does what it has to do, and uh, this doesn't do anything to the perilipin uh, mRNA. But if you have a polymorphism, as we have identified, in the three prime UTR of the perilipin form, suddenly that becomes very compatible. So it binds. So what if this microRNA binds here, what you have is that the translation of this uh, mRNA is going to be uh, stopped. And as a result of that, uh, what we have is that 
people with this genotype, they will have this phenotype, but people with this genotype, because of this binding of the microRNA, will have this phenotype. Now, again, is this something that is going to, we have to say, well, bad luck? Or is something that we can do? Well, this uh, individual is the same that this individual. What, what is the difference between this and this? Is that in this case, the answer to the problem, it will be into the omega-3s. So if you identify this polymorphism in this individual, then you can compensate for that. You can eliminate the problem just by adding a, or, or recommending a diet that is rich in omega-3. Well, these are just the original data, but uh, the bottom line is what I was telling you. Uh, this is not associated with obesity. This is associated with obesity, but even though there is a predisposition to obesity, we can compensate for that just by including the, in the diet or adding to the diet more omega-3s. But I wanted to leave you because with one uh, message coming from, uh, also from Spain, uh, the PREDIMED study, as you know, it was published as uh, um, in an intervention study, five years, uh, was published in the New England Journal of Medicine that Mediterranean diet specifically. Uh, uh, extra virgin olive oil and nuts is able to uh, be beneficial, is beneficial in terms of uh, prevention of uh, cardiovascular disease. Looking at events, not just at cardiovascular risk factors. In the examples that I gave you before, uh, I was associating the polymorphisms with obesity or with this epidemia, uh, but this is not the final disease. The final disease that we want to prevent is cardiovascular disease or stroke or any one of, uh, of your interests, of course. So we have the PREDIMED, and as you know, in this case, we have two groups. The intervention group with olive oil and nuts and the control group that was a low-fat diet. It's a good diet. It's what it has been recommended in the US for decades. And uh, we put that in the context in terms of uh, in gene diet interaction with this gene, the TCF7L2, that was identified as a gene related to diabetes, but also uh, related to a stroke. So, uh, look at this. In the control group, they were eating a prudent diet, low-fat diet. However, uh, the risk of a stroke uh, was depending on the genetic variation of this gene. So people without the mutation, they have a low uh, risk, uh, risk risk of a stroke, heterozygous in the middle, and homozygous much higher. So these people were predisposed to a stroke, and in fact, they manifested the stroke. But look, in the Mediterranean diet, the addition of olive oil and nuts was able to uh, precisely prevent the expression of this predisposition, and it doesn't matter which genotype you are, you have the same risk and low risk of a stroke that was prevented by the Mediterranean diet. So this is an example, and it's probably the best, the first, first example in which we take nutrigenomics, or gene diet interaction, not just to the level of connection with risk factor, but the bottom line, which is connection with disease and prevent, real prevention of disease. And this is something that we published uh, this year. So uh, the conclusion is that in the future, we all know about these four Ps of the future of medicine, in which will be predict predictive, and for that we'll use, we'll, we'll use the genome, but we have to use so many other things, epigenome and so on. We'll be able to go to the personalization in which uh, we'll be able to classify uh, people in different groups. Uh, so in some cases we will use diet, in other cases we'll have to use drugs and so on and so far. So we'll be able to, uh, to get to that preventive goal that we have, but obviously we'll not be able to do that without the participation of everybody, both the health professional, but also the patient. Uh, and then we shouldn't forget the P number five, which we have to do this with, uh, at least when it comes to nutrition, with uh, the pleasure that we take and uh, we drive out of uh, good food. Thank you very much. <laughs>